we're holding Sefer Mishlei Perek Chav Zayin, chapter 27. Al tit halil beyom machar kilot edam ayeled yom. He warns us not to be overconfident, not to boast for tomorrow, for you do not know what the day will bear. There's no way for us to know what will happen tomorrow. We're not prophets, even though we may be experienced. It's hard for a human being to make a promise thinking that he will for sure definitely be able to keep it. Who says he's going to be around tomorrow? And even if he's around, who's to guarantee that he will succeed? It doesn't mean we cannot make a promise. We can definitely make a promise. We can definitely reassure someone we're going to try our best. But to boast, that's the problem here. To boast. Al bit halil. Do not boast. A lot of people have that kind of uh, attitude that they promise thinking that for sure they will be able to do it. For sure they will succeed. It's an uh, overconfidence. Rabbis tell us in different words, Al tamen v'atzmecha diom motcha. Don't even be so sure about yourself when it comes to spiritual things that just because you were able to deal with a certain challenge successfully that you may be able to do it again. The Yetzirah of yesterday is not the same Yetzirah of today or of tomorrow. Even if you defeated him yesterday, you cannot be so sure you will do so tomorrow. The circumstances will be different and you may not be as strong. Yohanan Kohen Gadol, Rabbi Stavos, is a good example. He was a Kohen Gadol for 80 years. 80 years doing the job properly but in the end he became a tzduki. He joined the, the group of Jews who did not, did not, no, did not uh, accept the authority of the Chachamim, did not believe in the Torah Shabbat Peh completely. In other words, he had doubts. Even though after so many years of doing everything right, the Yetzirah got to him, whether it was for political reasons, for personal reasons, regardless, the human being is, is, is frail. The human being is uh, something that can change, you know, he can change his mind. He may have thought one way yesterday, and he has a different opinion today. Regardless of the motives, regardless of, uh, of what the situation is, you can never be so sure as to what will happen tomorrow. So Shlomo Melech here talks about the one who boasts, not the one who feels very strongly about something that Bezat Hashem will work out because of his past experience. That's okay. You're allowed to rely on your experience, on what you know from the past, but not to boast, because nobody can guarantee what will be tomorrow, what will happen. He translates over here, may a stranger praise you and not your mouth, an alien and not your lips. One has to be careful not to praise himself. Let it be someone else that points out your ma'alot, your strengths, not yourself. Rabbis tell us, Gnaihu la adam. It is something not in good taste. It's not nice for one to praise himself, to talk about himself. Let somebody else point out the good qualities, if there are any, and not yourself. Also, one should not take any credit or boast about something before it is done. Similar to what we just said before, who's to say that it's going to come out exactly the way you wanted it? Yes. Remember, the Torah says, Bar Anything which is a lie is not permissible. The only time that you are allowed to say a few extra words is for Hatan and Kala. Even though you don't like the taste of this groom, he chose a Kala that you don't think is anything special. But to him, she is special. So you're supposed to tell him, Great, you know, you, you, have, you, you have a good, uh, you have good taste. You chose yourself something very, very good, even though you don't think so. That's okay. That's a mitzvah. But uh, and to tell your wife, to tell your husband, we've spoken about it many times. For the sake of shalom bayit, you're allowed to overdo it a little bit, uh, but not when it comes to lying about yourself to others, lying about a shidduch. You have to be truthful. You cannot uh, mislead people. You can perhaps uh, put it in bold letters if you want, about something that you did in the past to bring it to his attention. But if it's a lie, then it's a lie. If it's not a lie, you're just using the better adjectives, you know, to embellish it. That's okay. As long as you're not lying. Yeah. Well, what I would say is, uh, usually a fellow, uh, uh, person, uh, 
Muhammad. You said you didn't say that before that trash like that trash the uh Shaitan um which which thing a trash. Muhammad that's nothing you know. Well, we talked about the uh, Another idea called Alti Tahpela Satan. Don't open up your mouth to the Satan. No, 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 no. That's in a negative context. When you say something negatively about uh, yourself, about the someone, so it's negative. So the Satan can, you know, can use that against you. You know, you're opening up your mouth to the Satan. You're saying something that you don't want to happen. Yeah, and even though you're just joking, but still you're opening up, as they say in English, a can of worms. You know, why, why, are, you, why are you talking about it? Why are you introducing it? You know, all you need is a satan to grab those words. It's like when one curses. You spoke about it. Be careful when you curse, because it may come true. So why did you, you know, why bring it up? That's what we mean by opening up the mouth of the satan. So anyway, so Shalomah Melech here tells us to be careful not to praise ourselves, not to... Uh, be overconfident about a situation. We don't know what will eventually happen. So therefore, don't talk too much about it beforehand. What do you? What happens, similar to your question, but a little bit differently, what happens if somebody goes to new territory where they don't know him, and he, he has certain qualifications, what he wants people to be aware of? It's okay for him to share his, you know, and let people know what his experience is, even though he's talking about himself. As you said before, selling himself, since they don't know about it, and they may be to their benefit to know, then it's permissible to do so. That's not called that he's boasting. He's simply letting him know what his capabilities are, what his, his experience is. He warned us that, Whoever pursues honor, then the honor will, will leave him. In other words, he will never be able to get that honor, since he's pursuing it. Honor has to come by itself. But if one pursues it, the one insists on people honoring him, people will not do so. It will run away from him. There was once an individual who came complaining to the rabbi, Rabbi, I always run away from honor, and I don't see the honor coming after me. I'm running away from it, right? If you run away from it, you're supposed to come. I, rabbi, I've been running away from the honor, and it hasn't come after me. So the rabbi tells him, you know why? Because you always look back. <laughs> to see if it's coming. <laughs> That's why it's not coming after you. Okay, next pasuk. The weight of a stone and the burden of sand, the anger of a fool is heavier than both. Stones are heavy, so is sand, but the anger of an evil. Interesting that the word evil is similar to the word in English, evil. So That's where it comes from. Right? A lot of English words and words in other languages come from Lashon HaKodesh, evil, evil, one who is wicked. We're not talking about exil, a fool, we're talking about an evil. The chaos of an evil, the anger of an evil person, Kavet Mishneim is heavier than the rocks and the stone and the, and the sand. What he's trying to say is that the anger of such an individual is very difficult. He, this is an individual who is very difficult to appease. This is an individual who uh, who may get angry over nothing, may get too angry, and therefore, this kind of an uh, this kind of an individual angers Akadosh Baruch Hu too, through his maasim. That's another pirush. Another commentary says that he is angering and evil angers Akadosh Baruch Hu, and as a result of that, caste comes down to the world. That anger comes down to the world. It's not just the cast of an ordinary individual, it's the cast of an evil. Now, he, this is really an introduction to what he's about to say. Because in the next pasuk he says, okay, I just told you how difficult the cast of an evil is, how anger is something that one should be care, very careful with. He says, cruelty and wrath and destruction of anger, but who can stand up before jealousy? I just told you how difficult the anger of an evil is. And this anger, what it could lead to, it could lead to cruelty. There are those people who become very cruel, but still, that's not the worst thing in the world, because anger can dissipate. Anybody who's angering, the anger can dissipate, even though this anger can lead to cruelty. But me, ah, who can stand before jealousy? Jealousy is something that will not dissipate. Somebody who's jealous will always be jealous. It will not go away. So again, he's talking about individuals and certain characteristics that he's done in the past. We talked about the one who's lazy, the one who's exil, who's a fool, 
the one who is jealous now, the one who is angry. Various midot that are no good. But here he points out that the jealousy is worse than anger. Even though we know that anger is terrible, but the ang- but the jealousy will never dissipate. One who is jealous will always be jealous. And what, is the, what do the rabbis tell us about jealousy? They remove him from this world. If a person is jealous, he can do many things, silly things, that will remove him from this world. What does it mean, remove him from this world? First of all, it means from this world or the world to come. It could be either or. A person who's jealous will covet or will desire certain things, and if he can't get a hold of these, if he cannot afford it, he will steal. If he will steal, he will. He may come to swear falsely. He may, as a, all as a result of jealousy. Jealousy can lead or breeds many other things, terrible things, and one loses control because of that jealousy that he cannot satisfy if he cannot afford it. Yes. Well, right. A person who's not too friendly, right? <laughs> An evil person is a, is a person who has evil intentions or evil designs. In other words, he's not a kind person. He, he's selfish, right? He thinks of himself. It's not just anger between a husband and wife or between two friends or between people who are getting along. No, we talk about the worst kind of caste, the caste of an evil person who therefore no matter what you say to him, it will be difficult to appease him, difficult to calm him down. There are situations where one spouse gets very, very angry at the other, but you can, you know, you can speak to them, you can calm them down, that there's a lack of communication between the two of you, there's a misunderstanding. People, some people get very angry, and sometimes, some of the times they get angry about silly things. But it's easier to handle that kind of anger than if it comes from one who's in a veil. No matter what you say to him, it's, it doesn't help. Still, Shlomo Merach says that that anger will dissipate. As opposed to kin'ah, if somebody has kin'ah, even though really the reality is anger is worse than kin'ah, anger is something terrible because a person can do t- some terrible things out of anger. But it, he says one of the benefits of anger is that it dissipates, it can go away. Whereas jealousy does not go away. If a person is jealous, he will always remain jealous. It's just something that is with him. And... Uh, it is curable, but it doesn't go away. There's nothing you can do to easily take away that jealousy. He has to work on himself. Everybody has to work on themselves, whether it's anger or, or jealousy. But how could, what he means here is how could you deal with it? How do you stand up to it? To somebody who's jealous, how do you tell him, don't be jealous? It's a lot harder than caste, which may just go away by itself, even if you don't do anything. Anyway, so we're done with kina and caste. Now he goes over the whole different area, some very important ideas that we've covered in the past, but with greater emphasis. Open rebuke is better than concealed love. Now, this has two meanings. Open rebuke means that somebody has something against you, somebody feels you've done something right, uh, wrong, then he tells you about it. He gives you musar, he criticizes you, and he means you're, ben- you're well your well-being. This tochacha, this musar, is better than ahava mesutare, than somebody that has a concealed love. Love, if it's not demonstrated, if it's only concealed, somebody feels that they like something about you, but they don't do anything, it, it has no impression, it leaves no impression, no roshem. The tochacha, the musar, the criticism, the rebuke, we don't like to hear it, but if it's, and if, especially if it's in the open, it's embarrassing. He says this kind of act a tochacha is a better, has better consequences than the ahava mesutare, than the concealed love. Somebody says they love you, but they don't, they don't wish you a happy birthday. They don't not write you a nice card. They don't buy you a gift. They don't demonstrate it. You know, there are husbands that tell their wife, you know, I love you, you know. Yeah, but you know, when was the last time you did this or you did that to, to, to prove it? So it's ahava mesutare. It could be it's there, but it doesn't do anything. Here you have the opposite. You have no love. You have tochacha. You have musar. You have one of the spouse or a friend giving musar to the other individual. That, believe it or not, that tochacha accomplishes more because at least it lets the person know where, what they did was wrong or what they need to improve on. That's just one interpretation. The commentaries actually say that the other interpretation is uh, much more relevant. In other words, it fits in a lot more into the pasuk, and this is how they interpret it. 
They say, Tovah Tochachat Negula Me'ahava Mesutaret. You know which Tochacha is good? You know which Musar is beneficial? Which one uh, goes a long way? If that Tochacha comes from an individual who cares about you. It comes, the Tovah Tochacha Negula, where does that Tochacha come from? Me'ahava Mesutaret. It's coming from someone who really cares about you. That Tochacha can go a long way. That Tochacha can make a difference. If somebody just criticizes you and, and they don't care about you, they don't really have a, a kesher with you, then you're not gonna, you're not gonna accept it. As well, I think Rabbi Yonatan, Rabbi Yonatan Eifschitz used to say, the musar of a friend is more powerful than a thousand speeches of the rabbi. One can hear a thousand speeches by the greatest rabbi about a certain topic, and it will not affect him. It will not influence him. But if, if it's his friend that gives him musar, and it's a very close friend, just one Musar, just a few minutes mi- minutes of Musar can make a big difference. Musar is rebuke, ethics, right? Pointing out something that something is wrong with the individual behavior. So that can make much more diff- much more of a difference if it's coming from one's heart. That's what he means over here. Even though it's concealed heart, but if you know that he means your well-being, you know that it's coming from your friend, not just coming from anybody else. That is a, a lot more powerful. Now he says over here, Tochachat Negula Me'ahava Mesutaret, because there's Ahava Gluya too. Ahava Gluya is an open, true love, whereas I have, right? But you're never sure 100% if it's true. Just because it's on the open doesn't mean that it's 100% pure, because a lot of hypocrites show a love, they smile at you, they even kiss you and hug you, but they don't mean it. It's fake. So on the open, you would th- you would think that it would be it would be real, but it's not always real. Ahava mesutaret. It's concealed. You're not a hundred percent sure if this is true love or not, because it's concealed. But you know who what, you know who it's coming from. It's coming from a friend that you've trusted in the past and that is reliable. So that kind of love, that kind of uh, of a relationship, is much, of course better than something which is unknown, something which is not uh, to be trusted. That's the difference between Ahava Mesutaret and Ahava that is Gluya. It could be on the open, but it's not 100% sure, 100% certain that it's it's real. Whereas if it's Ahava Mesutaret, if it's concealed, but you know where it's coming from, even though you haven't spoken to him for, for months, but you can count on him. That's, of course, uh, much better. And that leads us to the next pasuk. Wounds of an over are faithful. Uh, I think that there is, there's something wrong here with the translation. Nemanim pitzeohev means wounds of a friend are faithful, whereas kisses of an enemy are burdensome. Pitzeohev is like musar. In other words, he's wounding you. He's, in, he's not insulting you, but he's hurting you. But these are reliable, these are faithful, because he means your well-being. He, he cares about you. He wants you to have olam haba. So he tells you about something that you did wrong in order that you repair it. That is much better than the than the many, many kisses coming from an enemy. You know how the Arabs kiss. Three or four times, once on this cheek, then on the next cheek, then again on the right cheek. In Iran too, Moshe? All the Muslims? Yeah. Why three? Why not four or five? But anyway, all of those, those they don't mean anything. It's just for show. You can have one kiss, and that's a very true kiss, a very special kiss. It says a lot. Rabbis talk about the various t- kinds of kisses. There's a kiss between two individuals who haven't seen each other for a long time. There's a kiss of kavod, when somebody rises to a position on the forehead. There's a kiss on the hand, Right? There's very there's various kinds of kisses. There's the kisses between relatives. And then there's the kisses of fools. You know, there's a lot of people who, in their culture, that's all they do. Do they really mean it? Is it a real expression of love? No. It's just they do it. They, they are in, with just anybody. You know, I think the French are very much into that. Yeah. Yeah. For my wife, friends, in Shul, before the Sefer Torah, one should not kiss. Even, even one's own child. Perhaps a hug is okay. Yeah. Even yeah. One's own child. 
Sure, not before, not in front of the Sefer Torah. Yeah, I've seen people get aliyot and they kiss each other. Now what the, well, you know, what's the, what's this all about? <laughs> You know, that's what they need booster, Rabbi. They need booster to understand yeah. this problem. Right. Well, you have to let them know. Yeah. Anyway, a kiss is something very, very powerful. The Zohar speaks about what it means, especially between a husband and wife. And some, perhaps some other time we'll talk about it. And people misuse it. But the whole idea of the neshika, which you find also in Shira Shirim, is something very, very special. But it's misused. And that's what he points out in this pasuk that it's better to get hurt by a friend who you know he's, he's a friend. You know he's a real friend. It's better to get hurt by him. The hurt meaning to hear words that are not very, very kind words, but it's for our own good. It's musar. It's better to get that than to get just neshikot of a soneh, to get a kiss from somebody who doesn't really like you. You know. So what's what is it? What is the kiss? You know. But between people who are very very close. Obviously, the neshika it has a additional meaning. Another time, <laughs> another time. Yeah, yeah. I uh, I've spoken a little bit about it before, but uh, it all depends on the circumstances and which in the, and who the individuals are. So there's there's slightly there's some differences between them, but it's something very very special, very powerful. But what did we just say? Not all of, not all kisses are created equal, right? Mm-hmm. Not uh, not all of them. Uh, communicate the same thing. Some of them are not at all. They're just burdensome. They're not real. All right. Nefesh seviat avus nofet v'nefesh areva kol mar matok. Here he translates it. A uh, sated soul tramples honeycomb. But to a hungry soul, all bitter is sweet. Well, it's too difficult the English. Nefesh seviat avus nofet means a, an individual who's satisfied tramples or is not interested even in that which is sweet. The nefesh re'eva, in one who is hungry, kol mar matok, anything that is bitter, <clears throat> even if it's bitter, is it sweet to him because it is hungry. What is he talking about over here? There are various interpretations of this pasuk. One says that nefesh sevea is Shomo Melech is telling us the importance of midat istavkut, being content with what you have, even though you may not have too much, you should be happy with what you have. That's the nefesh sevea. The one who's content, tavus nofet, in other words, it, it looks down at even those things that are sweet because it doesn't need more. It, ha- it just has enough. It's seve'ah. The nefesh reva, but those who are always hungry to have more and more and more, kol mar matok, anything that is even bitter will appear sweet to them. Even if something is illicit, lo kasher, illegal, they will try to make money in whatever way they can even in illegal ways, because they have a nefesh re'eva. They're never happy, they're never satisfied. They always want more and more and more. So even something which is not 100% legal and kasher, to them will appear, oh, this is a good deal. It's sweet. That's one interpretation of nefesh sebea. According to Rashi, he's talking about the Torah, but there's some who have the attitude of, I've learned enough Torah, I'm satisfied, I don't want any more. And those who have a different attitude, a total opposite attitude, shehem mit'avim, they desire more and more and more. That it's never ending. They never feel that they've learned a lot. So they always want more, and therefore, kol mar matok, even if it's difficult, if it's bitter, it's, it's difficult, it's challenging for them, they still pursue it because it's, it, it's, they're interested in it. The fian yud that I wanted to give my own interpretation of this pursuit, the way I learned it, the way I understood it on my own, which somehow fits in with some of the interpretations. But it has to do with what Moshe Rabbeinu says will happen to the Jewish people when they become fat, when they become rich, when the Jewish nation, Yishurun, becomes fat, they become very rich, they rebel, they go against the Torah. That has happened historically too many times. And that's what happens here too. Nefesh seve'ah, tavus nofet. If one who is seve'ah, one who is fat and very, very satisfied, there's the risk of tabus, of trampling that which is sweet, that which is good. Whereas nefesh re'eva, one who is hungry, one who is poor, kol mar matok, even that which is bitter and not so tasty, to him will be sweet. Do you know how many people during the Holocaust were elated when they saw a few potato peels laying around? Potato peels. They were so hungry that anything they were able to put in their mouth made them happy. They were hungry, nefesh re'eva. Somebody who is very, very savur, savur, 
is very satisfied. He looks down, he throws away food. You know how much food is thrown away in this country? Once they serve it to you at the wedding, even if you didn't touch it, it's thrown away. There's so many hungry people in the world. Nefesh they don't, they, they don't look at it as something of value because they're, they're so comfortable and so rich. Tzipor no dedet min kina ken ish no dedet kumo. Anybody here travel more than 30 miles to work every day? You're lucky. Some people have to travel long distances to work. And that's what this pasuk is all about. Ketzipor no dedet min kina ken ish no dedet kumo. As a bird wandering from its nest, so is a man wandering from his place. In Berkat Amazon, one of the Special berachot that the Sefaradim say is shetiyeh parnasatenu krovah la'ir. That we may we merit that our parnasah should be close to town. We shouldn't have to travel long distances, get on a plane and travel to the east, far east. I mean, right to Asia. So many people do. There are more on the plane than they are at home. Yeah, there are a lot of people. That's how they live. Do they have a choice? Well, not really. They've gotten used to this routine of traveling hours and hours and hours by plane or traveling by car. I think the record for traveling by car to work every day is eight or nine hours in every direction. I think by car was six. I think by car was six and by train was eight. I forgot what it was. So they, they asked the lady, why do, you, why do you travel so far to work? She lives in, in Pennsylvania or in Indiana, somewhere she travels to New York. You know, it's a long... It's why, because she says, I want, I, I want to have my home in the suburbs, you know, and, and work in Manhattan. So, uh, <laughs> you know, that's what they want to do. And there was some other individual who was doing that too. That's not too good. You know, you want to have a normal family life. And, yeah. No, that's okay. No, here, here he's talking about how, what is he doing here? Shlomo Melech is describing how unfortunate are those individuals who have to be no dedim, who have to wander as he calls it here, from their nest. Well, it's much better if you wouldn't have to wander from your nest and be close to home and spend time with your kids. So he's describing a situation. Why is he describing it to us? For the, for the following reason. Reason number one, don't choose a job that's far away. Make less money if you have to, but stay closer to home. That's point number one. Point number two, when you see people who are coming here from Israel collecting money, feel sorry for them. You know what they're going through, having to go across the world to just collect a little bit of money? Feel sorry to them because it's, Ken Ish no Dead Mim Komo is not something very pleasant when an individual has to wander from his nest, right? That, that's the second idea behind it. Number three, the third point that the commentaries explain is that birds wander from their nest during the migration. You know how far they go, those monarch butterflies? They travel all the way from the southeastern portion of the United States all the way to Mexico. Yeah, every year, the same new generation, they've never been there, and they travel. You know how far it is for a monarch, a butterfly. Once you have all many birds, you have whales, fish, they have a migration route every year that they take, never miss, exact same one. Every generation, they've never been there before, how do they figure it out? But why are they doing it? Because they want to escape the cold. So the birds have no choice. If they need to escape the cold or the heat, and they need to go from place to place, that's fine. So the commenters explain, if that's the reason why we have to move, it should only be because the, si the situation is unbearable. In other words, if you do want to move, it should be for a good reason. He's discouraging anybody from just picking himself up and moving to another place. It's hard to pick yourself up. I feel sorry for the New Yorkers. In the winter, they're running away to Miami. In the summer, they're running away to the mountains. I asked them, said, what do you live in New York for? You're always running away. Why don't you just pick yourself up and move? You're always, you're always running away anyway, so just pick yourself up and move. But, but they've already had their businesses there. They have their, their schools, their families, they've made roots. It's hard for somebody to pick himself up and go. And can you imagine if you want to move to Israel? which is a whole different change in lifestyle, mentality. To make that move, a lot of people have tried it and have come back. It's hard. On the other hand, if things are not going well for you, you may want to think of moving because that is part of our tradition that sometimes 
the changing of location can better your mazal. So things have to be very bad for one to really consider moving. Otherwise, it's, it's, it's hard to move from place to place. Shemen uktoret isamach lev umetek re'eu me'atzat nafesh. Oil and incense make the heart rejoice, and the sweet words of his friend more than one's own counsel. We will be talking a little bit about friendships here now. Oil and incense, they gladden the heart, we enjoy them, but there's something even better than that, and that is the, the good advice coming from a friend. Sweet words of a friend can do a lot more than, than anything else. This is a very important point. We sometimes underestimate how, what the power of an, a kind word is. Sit down with somebody who is depressed, somebody who's having a hard time struggling, and be patient and listen to them and talk to them. And we talk about people who are close, they know each other. Sweet words, good counsel, this could really make a big difference. You can really uplift them, encourage them, make them feel better. It's a good thing to do. Who else can he turn to? What is a friend for if not for talking about the situation, seeking advice, getting some help? So the, the, these, these words that are coming from metek re'el, these words that are, are kind words, sweet words, coming from a friend, it's more than one's own counsel. The next pasuk has various ideas all lumped together in one pasuk. This pasuk has various ideas, important ideas. Do not forsake your friend and your father's friend. Do not enter your brother's house on the day of your misfortune. And a close neighbor is better than a distant brother. So we have here three ideas all in one pasuk. I'm really not sure why he put it all in one pasuk, but they, they perhaps belong with together. Somebody that has been a friend of the family, a friend of your father, a friend for a long time, be very careful with that friendship. Hold on to it, because that's a very, very precious asset. A friend is a very pr- valuable asset, especially if he's been a friend of the family for a long time. In your, in your day of misfortune, you're having trouble. Don't come to your brother. Because that brother may not help you. A brother will not help another brother? He says, yeah. Because sometimes it's just a fact. That sometimes a good friend, a good neighbor, is better than a brother who's been very distant, who hasn't been behaving like a brother. Unfortunately, there could be two brothers from the same father and mother, same blood, but they're so far apart from each other, the two friends are much closer. I'm sure many of you are aware of this. Not all brothers, unfortunately, of the same father and mother are as close as they should be. They, they, they really should be. But unfortunately, they do it to themselves. It's not because there's a lack of uh, love to begin with. They are born from the same father and mother. There should be a natural connection. They share the same father and mother. That should be natural. It should be normal. But no. Sometimes there's problems that get in the way. And therefore, he says, if you have a misfortune, you may not want to turn to that brother. You may want to turn to that one who's more reliable, who has proven himself in the past, a neighbor or a friend. Another interpretation of Re'a, Re'a Chav, Re'a Avicha, we're talking about Kadosh Baruch Hu. He's also your friend. He has proven himself. As uh, Kadosh Baruch Hu has promised, if you follow my mitzvot, I will be kind to you. If you not, I will give you musar, tochacha. So you don't want to let go of that relationship with Kadosh Baruch Hu. Be very careful with that relationship. Unfortunately, what has happened over the years, either the Jews have become very comfortable, they have assimilated to the Goyim because of the various pressures in society, and they and they cared more about that relationship than their relationship with Hashem. That is why the rabbis tell us a very important rule. One cannot fully develop a good relationship with the Kadosh Baruch Hu if he's not able to develop a strong relationship with another human being. We hear we say in the Kriyashma, What a lofty goal. Love Hashem. Love Hashem. It's something that I do not see, but I'm told to do. Well, how do I love Hashem? I fulfill His mitzvot, even in the most difficult situations, because I do so out of love, not out of fear. But that cannot happen if one does not really have a good friend that he can, you know, show that he cares for, that he's devoted to. It has to start with Ahavat Re'im, Ve'aftal Yerecha Kamocha, Ani Hashem. If you are able to demonstrate that kind of a 
of a devotion to another human being, to another individual, that will that means you have the tools to be able to fully develop Ahavat Hashem, which is much more difficult. So you see, it's not almost it's it's almost impossible for one to have Ahavat Hashem, truly Ahavat Hashem, if he's not if he does not have that kind of a devotion to another human being. That is why the Rabbis advice is Knelecha Khaver, acquire a friend, have someone that you can turn to, that you can speak to, that if he tells you Musar, he tells you off, you will accept it, because people do not accept Musar from just anybody, criticism. But if it's from a friend, as we've said before, that you know he's a true friend, and what he's saying is for your own good, then it will be accepted. Hopefully it will make a difference. That is the value of a, of a true friend. Another interpretation here is that Shlomo Melech is talking about be careful not to let go of your Torah, you've learned Torah. Torah that one has spent 10 years learning, he can lose it in two years if he does not review it. This is your friend, this is your connection to Hashem, don't let go of it. A lot of people unfortunately have gotten too involved in their businesses and they were very smart, they did very well in the yeshiva, they studied a lot of Torah and all of that they have studied is either forgotten or is meaningless because they did not review it. So what is a true friend? Even though this is a whole lecture in itself, commentaries explain that anybody who is a true friend to you and all of a sudden is not a friend anymore because you haven't been kind to him, you haven't uh, given him whatever you've been giving him till now, that's you've been helping him all along with something. And all of a sudden you stop helping him or giving him whatever it was that you were giving and he stopped being your friend that's not a true friend, because that means that he was only a friend so long as you were good to him, so long as you were giving him and helping him and whatever it was. It was Ahavash Tluya Vedavar. Or let's say you got angry, you got upset at your friend, and because you got upset at him, he's no longer your friend. Well, he was never a good friend to begin with, because if he's no longer your friend because you got upset at him, in other words, if he cannot handle that upsetness, that means it's, it's not a solid friend. Solid friend will like you with all your faults, will understand you if you're upset at him. Small, if small issues interfere with the friendship, if they stop it, small issues, issues that are not major, then you know that it was never a friendship to begin with. A good, solid friendship can weather all the storms in the world. It would have to be something very, very serious, you know, that to undo it completely. But if something silly, something minor, undoes a friendship, if they don't keep in touch anymore, they don't talk, they don't call. That means there was never a solid friendship to begin with. Some people think they have true friends, but they don't. <laughs> I'm not advising you to test them. It's not necessary. But don't think, don't think that they're real, because the majority of them are not real. They will not be there for you, unfortunately, when you really need them. If you're lucky, you have one. If you're really lucky. Yes? Um, <laughs> The one? Yeah. 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 So, uh, how does that fit into what we said earlier? The answer to that person becomes a friend. Is that kind of like? I'm not sure what the question is. The what? I guess the question is, you know, if you're not a friend, you're like a supporter friend. How is that something you want? You just actually support your friend. I think you know, there's something about that. How does that compare to like? There's no obligation for you to support anybody. I mean, if you have a mitzvah to do tzedakah, to do chesed, and uh, of course with those who are closer to you, they're your, re your, your relatives, you have even a greater obligation, more of a responsibility somebody that you've helped in the past and that's dependent on you, perhaps you're more obligated to him. But that has nothing really to do with friendship. I mean, somebody who's your friend, obviously you're probably going to go out of your way because he's so important to you that you will do so much for him, if necessary, almost anything. But if you don't do it, you can't do it, you don't want to do it for whatever reason, it doesn't mean that you don't care for him anymore. It could be that, you know, you just don't... Uh, you, you, whatever, for whatever reason, you, you don't want to do it anymore. But you still care for him. It's not a contradiction. As I said before, it would have to be something very, very major that if, if one were to do to another, that that would basically show that he doesn't care about the friendship anymore. But to support 
financially, it's not really a sign of anything. And I have two very, very good friends, and one needs help, and the, and the friend does not help him, and he can help him, then obviously there's a question mark there. Why not? According to the Kabbalah, Tov Shachen Karov Me'achrachok, the Kabbalah says something very interesting, that any two individuals who are from the same Shoresh neshama, from the same root of the soul, will always feel much closer than two brothers from the same father and mother who are not from the same Shoresh neshama. So that's more of a Kabbalistic explanation as to why certain individuals in this world feel so close because they could be from the same Shoresh neshama. There's various reasons why people feel close. You know, there's also the, you, even people who have the same name, Yitzchak and Yitzchak, will have a certain affinity. David and David, Moshe and Moshe. I mean, that's what it's written. That the same name creates or generates a certain affinity. People that their mazalot are compatible. That is a very, very strong affinity. Then what happens if their mazalot is compatible and they're from the same Shoresh HaNeshama? Can you imagine that? That's even very, even stronger. So there's various levels of closeness in this world depending on what's connecting between them. But the Shoresh HaNeshama apparently is something that the Kabbalah says makes a difference. People don't know why these two individuals who are not on the same level. <coughs> one is a dropout from school and the other one is a genius, a PhD. They're, they're best friends. I read a story like that. Nobody could understand what was going on between them. Well, why did they like each other? They, they don't know themselves. They just felt very close. I mean, without the Kabbalah, you can just say because it's the compatibility of their signs, the Mazal, the astrology. But it could be more than that. It could be deeper than that. Yes. The what? Yes. For the most part, the family reincarnates yeah. together. Yeah, but that's within the, within the same family, but it's not always from the same Shoresh. Shoresh is the root of a Neshama, is something completely di- uh, different. Okay, we just have a couple more Pesukim. Chacham beni v'samach libi v'ashiva chorfi davar. Now he's turning to his son, and he's telling him, Be wise, my son, and cause my heart to rejoice, that I may answer him who taunts me. In other words, Shlomo Melech is telling us, or he's telling his own ch- uh, son, invest in friendships, I just told you that. But I also invest in Chokhmah. Because if you are going to become a Chacham, you're going to make me happy. There's a few things that make a father happy. There's a few things that bring Nachat to the parents, even after they have left this world. And that is if the child follows in their footsteps, or if the child is better than they are, right? In some way, they do a mitzvah. That mitzvah does something to the neshama. Because a child is an extension of his father. He's his emissary, his ambassador in this world once the father has left. If a child does not do something right, it hurts the parent. If he does something right, says the Kaddish, he learns the Mishnayot, he gives Taka, it, it elevates the Neshama. So here Shalom is telling us, is telling the, the, the son, be smart, learn Chokhmah, be a Chacham, don't be a fool, don't be exceeding. Because if you are a Chacham, that will make me happy too. The next Pasuk, Arum Ra'a Ra'a Nistar Petayim Avru Ne'enashu. A cunning man saw harm and hid, but fools passed and were punished. This is similar to what the rabbis tell us in Pirkei Avot, Ezu Chacham Haro'et Hanolad. Who is a truly smart person? One who sees the consequences of his actions. He thinks before he does something. He weighs the pros and cons of everything. Or as he says here, a cunning man saw harm and he hid. He saw what's coming. He saw what happened to others who have done this and he hid. He did not take action. He was careful. That's very good. That's a chacham. You don't want to repeat the mistake of others. You have an advantage. You've seen what they've done. So be careful. Don't invest in junk bonds. You see what happens to people invested in junk bonds? You saw what people invest, happened in the, who you saw what happened to people who invested in the stock market. In, in, I'm talking about those aggressive stocks, but some people love to take risks. They say you can make much more money in the stock market than in real estate. Yeah, but which one is more secure and which one is riskier? You willing to lose it? Then go ahead. You willing you to try your out? Fine, but it's not a good idea. That's what he says over here. Look at what has happened to others and learn from their mistakes. Don't repeat their mistakes. So a true hacham 
weighs his actions very carefully. And the last pasuk is a very familiar area. We've covered it many times, and, and apparently he talks about it a lot. And that is, Kah bigdo ki arav zaru be'adnu havlehu. Take his garment because he stood surety for a stranger and hold him in pledge for an alien woman. He's talking about, again, an Arev, one who has co-signed to guarantee the loan for another individual. So Shalom Melech is telling the, uh, the judge, or the judge is telling the, the one who gave the loan, take his garment, go ahead, take the collateral, because he stood surety, it's his fault. He, he guaranteed for a stranger, hold him in pledge for what he did. It's his mistake. This pasuk is related to the previous pasuk of, of watching out for all these mistakes that people make. Why, why get involved? You see what has happened to other people, or as they say in this country, in Murphy's Law, if anything can go wrong, it will go wrong. I'll tell you a quick story. With well, this, we'll finish. It just happened. This uh, car dealer, a friend of mine, sold a car, and the man gave him the money pretty quickly, $4,000. What does that show? That he's honest, I guess. He came with, back with the money, he proved it, his word is a word, he paid for it, and that's it. A week or two later, the same individual came back and told him a story about that he needs to buy a car in Vegas and he's going to get him the pink slip, but right now he doesn't have the money and could he first, can he lend him the money to go and pay the owner of the car? And he's going to bring in the pink slip as a collateral, a whole story. And of course, it was completely fabricated. As we say in Hebrew, Lo dubim velo yar. There was ne- it was never such a thing at all. There was no car, there was no nothing. And uh, he has to take him to court right now to get back his money. Now, why did he lend him the money? Because he trusted him the first time. He came up with the money, he paid him the money. Right? He trusted him. But he should have listened to his wife. Because the wife says, no, I smell a rat. Don't do these things. Don't lend the money if there is a chance that you're going to lose it and you're going to feel bad about it. Now, if it's $100 and you won't lose any sleep over it, fine. But otherwise, we have a rule, you have to be respectful of everybody, but be suspicious. Now, we're not going to talk about those who don't intentionally want to, want to give back the, the loan. We're going to talk about those who simply can't. They were able to afford it yesterday. Now they lost their job. Now, they, even if they wanted to, they can't pay so why take this risk? Why take a chance? So what do we learn from this story? Listen to your wife. Women have a good intuition. If they tell you, I don't like this individual, there's something wrong with him, don't invite him over next time. Uh, there's something about him I don't like. Pay close attention to what they're saying. They're, they know. They have, a, they have a very well-developed intuition about human beings. doesn't mean that you should uh, listen to just everything they say. You know, sometimes uh, they're wrong too, right? When it comes to guests, the, when it comes to guests, the rabbis tell us women don't like having guests because then they have to go out of their way to prove themselves that they're good, good hostesses. So just surprise your wife with a guest because if you ask her in advance, she says no, I'm not up to it. But don't surprise her either because then she'll be very upset at you. Why don't you let me know? So what's the best thing to do is just give her a little bit of head notice, you know, some time to prepare. But don't ask, can I? Yeah, but anyway, if you have a good relationship with your wife, if you if you have a good relationship with your wife, then obviously it's never going to be a problem unless you bring 20 guests over. Sure. Then perhaps <laughs> you're going to run into trouble. Anyway, the point over here is, Shlomo Melech repeats this, this point very, very well. He emphasizes this point a lot, and that is be careful with being a guarantor, be careful with human beings. Human beings may appear honest, but they're not. Even if they have a long beard, and they pray at Shmona Esther for a half an hour, and they pray at nets, and they eat glad kosher food, but uh, they can still be corrupt. Then don't take any chances. Don't make the mistakes that other, made, that other people made. If you're a hacham, hacham ro'et hanulad, you see the consequences, and therefore you, you take, you're, 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 you're more cautious. And that is what he tries to share with us. These are the mistakes people have made over and over, and what does he say in Kohelet? En chadash tachat hashamesh. There's nothing new under the sun. The same people that exist then exist now. The same corruption then exists now. The same dishonest people then exist now. And by the way, this man that I just told you that uh, did not uh, give back the money, he went and got married in a restaurant 
and he told the owner, I just have to take some pictures outside. After the pictures were taken, he just ran away and didn't pay. No, no. I don't know, but anyway, the, the, <laughs> you see, you see, there are, there are nochlim, nochlim, there are, how do we say nochel in English? There are crooks, crooks in this world, yeah? And he, you, you're going to be guaranteeing your pension and your house for somebody you don't know? Even if it's somebody you know, you may lose it. Don't say, oh, it's not going to happen. It's, don't ever say that. If anything can go wrong, it will go wrong. The best way to deal with this situation is to be a chacham. If it has happened before, it can happen again. And you don't need to take these risks. It's a mitzvah to help, but there's no mitzvah to get yourself into trouble. Okay, we'll continue next week with that.